This is a short video on four extracellular bacteria that infect the lungs. We're going to be talking about Haemophilus influenza, Bordetella pertussis, Streptococcus pneumoniae, and Mycoplasma pneumoniae. And we're going to be going through each of these categories that are listed across the top here for each of these four extracellular bacteria. So let's get started with Haemophilus influenzae. Haemophilus is an extracellular bacteria, as we said, and it's an obligate human pathogen, which means that it cannot live in the environment and it cannot live in animals. It's an extracellular bacteria that must live in humans. It's a gram-negative organism, and it has a polysaccharide capsule around that gram-negative cell wall. And this polysaccharide capsule is pretty important for the treatment and the vaccine and uh, we, we categorize these polysaccharide capsules by, by letter A through F. The shape is a coxobacillus, which is kind of round, kind of rod-shaped, somewhere in between for Haemophilus. Haemophilus is only found in the respiratory tract, and it's sometimes part of the commensal bacteria. This means that it's not always a, uh, a pathogen. It's not always bad. It's not always causing disease. Um, it is possible to find Haemophilus as part of the normal flora in the lungs, but uh, majority of the time it's it's causing a problem, it's causing a pneumonia. But it, it could be commensal, could be commensal. Usually pathogenic, could be commensal. How is it transmitted? Haemophilus is transmitted through respiratory droplets, so treating a patient with Haemophilus influenza requires droplet precautions. Haemophilus, as we said, can cause a pneumonia. It can, it can also cause several other infections throughout the body, specifically meningitis, epiglottitis, and otitis media. Meningitis and epiglottitis are caused by the B variant of the polysaccharide capsule. That's Haemophilus influenza B, sometimes abbreviated to HIB. And uh, otitis media is... Um, is a pretty common infection caused by Haemophilus influenza, and it's caused by a non-typable Haemophilus influenza. There are three main virulence factors that are on Haemophilus. This includes the pili, which are little projections from the cell that Haemophilus uses to attach. It uh, also includes lipooligosaccharides, which are similar to lipopolysaccharides um, that you find in other gram negatives, and polyribocele phosphate, which is a material found in the capsule of the cells. The vaccine for Haemophilus is a conjugate vaccine. So keep talking about this polysaccharide capsule that Haemophilus has, and uh, that's what we're going to use to make a vaccine. So the polysaccharide capsule is attached to a tetanus or to a tetanus protein toxoid, and um, this allows children who don't have a good immune response to polysaccharides uh, it allows them to make antibodies against the polysaccharides themselves by connecting it to a protein toxoid. And that's probably worth looking into how a conjugate vaccine works when you connect a polysaccharide to a protein and uh, the body ends up making an antibody against that polysaccharide. Next, we have Bordetella pertussis, another extracellular bacteria. This is another obligate human pathogen, another, and this is actually a obligate aerobe, which works out pretty well because it's present in the respiratory tract. This is another gram negative, another coxobacillus, and Bordetella pertussis is only found in the respiratory tract. Bordetella is highly communicable, and it's spread through respiratory droplets. Disease for Bordetella, it causes whooping cough. This is a disease that in the United States, uh, children, vast majority of children get a vaccine for. Uh, it does have a pretty normal progression. First two weeks of getting infected with Bordetella is usually an incubation period. The next seven days, one to seven days, are the catarrhal phase, where you child generally has cold symptoms, and it's kind of kind of a pain because it's easiest to isolate the bug. It's easiest to isolate pertussis during this catarrhal phase, where you just see standard cold symptoms. The next one to four weeks is the paroxysmal phase, where the child starts having the whoop, the characteristic whooping cough, with a worse cough and uh, leukocytosis, so high white blood cells, and it's harder to detect the blood or the, the bug during this period. So it's, it's kind of a pain that it's easier to identify the bug when the symptoms are not as bad, when you think it might just be like a viral cold, but harder when you actually hear the characteristic whoop. And after that, there is a recovery phase. 
So the vaccine for whooping cough has been around for a while. It used to be cellular, and it's paired with a couple other vaccines, diphtheria and tetanus, I believe, in DTP. Newer vaccine is now acellular, so we call it DTAP, where the P is pertussis, the A is acellular. Um, recent studies have shown that this new vaccine, the acellular Bordetella pertussis vaccine, is less effective. A couple of virulence factors that they include inside the vaccine are pili, again for attachment, a pertussis toxin, and a protein called pertactin. And it's important to note that the vaccine for pertussis prevents the symptoms. It prevents the host response to Bordetella pertussis. It does not necessarily prevent colonization. Now, this means that somebody can be infected with Bordetella pertussis even though they got the vaccine. It's possible for me, for instance, who has had the Bordetella pertussis vaccine to have Bordetella pertussis in my lungs. I just never expressed symptoms. I never had whooping cough because I've been vaccinated. Vaccine prevents symptoms, not colonization. Next, we have streptococcus pneumonia. That's a pretty important one for pneumonia. It's another extracellular obligate human pathogen. This is a gram positive. Streptococcus is always gram positive. It's the leading cause of community acquired pneumonia. Uh, pneumonia is usually divided into hospital acquired and community acquired, and streptococcus is prevalent in both of them, um, but by far the most prevalent leading cause of community acquired pneumonia. There's, uh, this generally causes an acute pneumonia with a typical presentation. Typical presentation usually means a lobar pneumonia as opposed to a diffuse pneumonia. You see it isolated to one lobe. Um, could cause blood-tinged sputum. The biggest virulence factor for streptococcus pneumonia is the polysaccharide capsule, and it could also cause infections in other parts of the body, such as the inner ear, uh, otitis media, sinus bronchitis, pericarditis, and sepsis. We used to treat streptococcus pneumonia with penicillin. Now it requires a broad spectrum cephalosporin and eventually vancomycin. Vancomycin is kind of our last line treatment for streptococcus. We don't want to use it if we don't have to. There are vaccines for this one. Pneumovax 23 is a polyvalent capsular vaccine. It uh, protects against 23 variants of streptococcus pneumonia that is used for adults. There is a conjugated vaccine that's used specifically for children. As we said earlier, uh, conjugated vaccines are better for children because children do not have quite as good of a response to polysaccharide antigens in the vaccines. So we have a conjugated vaccine that prevents against 13 strains. It's called Prevnar 13 for children. Lastly, we have mycoplasma pneumonia. This is a tiny extracellular bug, uh, very small. It does not have a gram stain and it does not have an acid fast stain. Very, very small. I believe it's the smallest organism that can survive on its own, the smallest extracellular bacteria. It appears in outbreaks because of two reasons. First, it has a long incubation period and a low transmissibility rate. Mycoplasma, tiny little bug, spreads in respiratory droplets tiny little bug that causes a walking pneumonia. So I kind of remember that it's a tiny bug and it causes kind of tiny symptoms. Pneumonia that you could live with, you could walk around with, chronic pneumonia. Long incubation period can persist for a while, but it's not that bad. It's not as bad as streptococcus pneumonia. There are attachment organelles that vary antigenically, and this makes sense. As a bacteria, you would want to vary your surface quite a bit. Um, there aren't many characteristic cytokines for, for mycoplasma, but we do know that it does secrete hydrogen peroxide, and there are a variety of antibiotics to treat mycoplasm, mycoplasma pneumonia. But most importantly, it causes a chronic walking pneumonia that can persist for a while. I hope this presentation was helpful. Thank you for listening.